boys and ghouls. Welcome to episode 51 of Dads from the Crypt, the Tales from the Crypt podcast. My name is Jason. I'm joined by Jody. I'm not sure how to say hello this week. Mondo threw me off last week, so I'm not really sure what to say. So I'm just going to say hello. I'm here. That works. Uh, Mondo? Howdy. <laughs> there we go. And tonight we're joined by a very special guest. His name is Steven Kostansky, who directed Psycho Goreman, Leprechaun Returns, The Void, and of course, Father's Day. Welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me, guys. Thanks for coming on. This is a big treat. I think all three of us are big fans of pretty much all those movies, especially uh, Psycho Goreman. Uh, probably my favorite movies of, you know, I, I don't even know what year that was because COVID just ruined everything, but I it was know, definitely a COVID. The past few years have all kind of melted together, unfortunately. But Psycho Gourmet was definitely one of my uh, comfort watches. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, That's good. That's all I wanted it to be was just a nice little uh, blast of late 80s, early 90s nostalgia for guys uh, like us. So. I remember vividly we were in San Diego and we were driving home. My friend was texting me how much he hated it. And I was like, good. He hates it. it means I'm going to love this movie because he's because <laughs> he's the kind of person I can't have fun. If it's fun, it sucks. And I, I sat down and watched it. I'm like, this is what I wanted during the pandemic. Just 100 percent just it's I, also I, yeah. it's a movie that uh like i feel like i'm trolling people who don't like to have fun mm-hmm. like, <laughs> yes. because the movie just gets like progressively more absurd and anytime my instinct was like oh like you know you're really like bending the rules of reality here i told myself like well no that's the point like oh no because yeah you're not making a good movie if you don't have half the audience like flipping out with excitement and the other half is flipping out uh, with anger and rage at your movie. You, ne- you need to have that kind of like split response to know you made an impact. So yeah. what I love about it, it's one of those movies where every time I watch it, I pick out something new, a new detail in the back, kind of in the backgrounds or like in plain sight. There's a lot of absurd stuff layered throughout. I mean, I grew up on uh, stuff like The Simpsons, which mm-hmm. is so good at like stacking jokes and visual gags. And so it was just something where not just myself, but like the whole crew were just aware of the whole time. So I feel like everybody was on the same page as far as like, how how can we make this scene dumber? And how can we be like, <laughs> like what kind of like weird lore can we just add that m- makes people go like, what's up with that thing in the background? Like really the whole movie was inspired by scenes like the bounty hunter reveal in Empire Strikes Back where it's mm-hmm. like, those characters are on screen for like five seconds. And you see, as a kid, I remember seeing them and being like, I need to know, like, what that bug man's deal is. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, that logic permeates the whole movie of just, like, I just want to show stuff and not explain it and let people come up with their own weird stories. Oh, yeah, like that council scene, like, with the, that one with the with just the brain in the bottle. Oh, I love it. It's, oh, yeah. yeah, you're like, what's that guy's deal? Yeah, yeah it's, it's, you got to let the audience use their imagination a little bit. Like, I think that's something a lot of movies are lacking right now is they just explain everything. Mm-hmm. And I'm a big fan of seeing stuff and then pondering it after the movie and wondering, like, well, what was going on there? And why was that <laughs> like that? Like, that's half the fun. You want the audience to participate a little bit and not spell everything out for them. So. It, it, speaking of that, too, I was a huge fan of The Void, which I yeah. thought did that oh, really, yeah. really well. Because by the end of that movie, I'm like, I know what I watch, but I need to watch it again now because I need to pick up different little pieces of it. And uh, that was a fantastic one, too, especially the effects in there Mm -hmm. and the contortion you got to play the I guess the demon at the end. Oh, man, just wonderful stuff. Well, thank you. I I appreciate that. And that's another movie that got a polarizing, polarizing response uh, because we were so obtuse with our storytelling. Mm -hmm. Like Jeremy and I, uh, Jeremy Gillespie, who I co-directed it with, like really set out to tell a story that didn't give you all the answers and that seemed to really piss people off at the time (laughs) i find that ironic now that i feel like so much genre stuff leans into that and like people are pushing this like cosmic horror idea and like the the the, like vast unknown and how Mm -hmm. terrifying that is and it's like well that's what we were doing back in 2016 and people were pretty lukewarm on it at the time so (laughs) yeah it landed with you yeah, I mean, Mondo might allow like the, the Beyond, which is one of your favorites too. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. So okay, I got a couple of quick hit questions for Psycho, about Psycho Gorman though. Mm-hmm. What's up with the Alan Grant costume? Uh, okay, so <laughs> it's partially just a like production logic question. Like 
working in creature effects, working in prosthetics, I, I know that creature suits do not look good in broad daylight. Mm. And I knew it was totally unavoidable that PG would have to be out in the daytime at some point in this movie. And so we decided like, okay, well, they should give him an outfit to fill out those scenes. So he's at least like covered in some way. The initial idea okay. was to just cover him up. But then, you know, because of how my brain works, it became like, okay, well, if we're covering him up, he's out in the broad, he's out in broad daylight. The mystique is gone. Like, how can we make this extra stupid? And <laughs> you know, we just kept thinking, like, well, what what outfit would look good on him? Because there was just like a few like logistical things with the suit as well. Like, what can he actually fit into that would work? So it couldn't be anything too elaborate. He still needed to do some physical stuff, so it couldn't be too restrictive. And I was just like scrolling through random pictures on the internet and I just saw a photo of like Sam Neill with his shades on in Jurassic Park and was like, that's a good, simple, weird outfit. <laughs> like, and it's a good example of like the kind of nonsense I like to inject mm -hmm. in my movies because it instantly got people being like, what the fuck is up with that? Like, <laughs> yes. of, of all the outfits, why is that the one? And like it also, I think it just speaks to like the time period. Like mm -hmm. people inaccurately say that it's like an '80s movie when really it's more like early '90s. Yeah, and I feel mm -hmm. like the fact that they're very clearly playing N64 and the Alan Grant costume, I oh. think lands it in like mid '90s. Even. Yeah, well, it's it's a lot of the Power Rangers, but like you know, with actual gore. Yeah, but, yeah, exactly. And but so yeah, the Alan Grant thing was to kind of help set it in this like non-specific 90s time period that's great because yeah that's one of those things where it's so weird and absurd but in a movie that has like people exploding but that's the thing that like i, I want to know the most about yeah well and i feel like most movies don't push that far like i was very fortunate to have a scenario where the financiers like did not give a shit and they're like just make a fun movie and they didn't care oh, like great. like i feel like if i tried to make that movie through proper channels like it would have like stuff like the Alan Grant costume would have gotten axed like in pre-production at some point. So they would have like maybe uh, cited some sort of like copyright issue or something. No. But we were like, yeah, let's just do it because it's funny. And I think having that kind of freedom is why that movie is as wacky as it is because yeah. there really was no, there wasn't a lot of workshopping. Like there wasn't like sitting around a boardroom with studio executives being like, like pitching them my idea and having to get their input and like you know their stupid creative notes on stuff <laughs> nice. i just like an idea popped in my head and i did it so that's why there's that kind of dumb shit in the oh world. i love it i love it um and then i also wanted to know if there's any possibility of any like neca style psycho gorman figures i know they did like a little like a a smaller one when they came out there's like the uh yeah they're like the kenner style yeah. figure mm -hmm. yeah which i think are still available at plastic meatball uh they're awesome i love them plastic meatball did a great job uh but there might be more on the way uh that are maybe more in the style of your liking that i'm not allowed to say awesome. yet okay and say love that, it. that question you're asking will have an ad answer at some point uh hopefully soon all right, speaking awesome. of questions that you probably can't answer, but I'm going to ask anyways, any thoughts on a sequel or follow-up in that right. universe? I'm trying, I'm trying to make that shit happen, and everybody asks, and, like, I I get the logic of, like, hey, we like this thing. Can we have more of that thing? Right <laughs> uh, but the issue is that there's a lot of moving parts to make that happen. Right. And not right. just that, but it's, it, like, full disclosure, like, I don't want to make it unless i can pay people to do the work yeah. like it was very right. much a labor of love that first movie and very much like people calling in favors and people like just helping out because they wanted to help me on my movie and you know i'm super grateful to them for that and i don't want to put people through that again i want people to do it and earn a living doing it and awesome. unfortunately we're in kind of this weird zone with genre stuff right now where the attitude is like you can make it for like five hundred thousand dollars, right? And that's not 
realistic for a movie mm -hmm. that for to make a movie that delivers on what you guys want to see in a sequel like i i need to make it for a bit more than that so that's the real honest answer of where i'm at is i'm work like working out the plot and working out how to do it in a way that uh, is actually achievable and can deliver on screen and behind the scenes sure. on what needs to happen i think i speak of these gentlemen too i'd rather wait six yeah. seven years for a sequel and have it be an awesome sequel mm -hmm. and have it just be a cashing because that because because so many yeah. you know i mean hellraiser friends you got the hellraiser shirt on you know that turned into a cash-in series and yeah. uh, whenever it gets to that point it's just it, you can kill it really easily by doing that and i mean i feel like if i can make an honest prediction of what the universe of pg is going to be i see it going the like don coscarelli phantasm road mm. of like probably yeah. every few years I'll try to make one happen and it may never be like a big studio thing. Uh, but I hope I can make it at a comfortable level, like I was That's saying. Cool. And so, yeah, it may, it may take a little longer than people would like in this age of instant gratification with media all the time. Sure. But, uh, you will be rewarded for your patience. That's all I'm going to say. Well, I'm sure if you need some middle-aged dads to come up and uh, throw intense gore and prosthetics on, we'll come up to uh, wherever in Canada you're probably... Sure. I'll cast, <laughs> I'll cast all your heads and blow your heads off. That's all I've ever that's, wanted. That's my dream, really. Yeah. I was say, don't threaten us at a good time. because. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I mean, if you guys can make the trip up here, I'll do it. I mean, hey. somebody will have to do all that immaculate hair punching on all of you because, of course... <laughs> have facial hair so someone's <laughs> have to sit there and do that hard well labor, the good news is me and Jordan are lacking up here so it's only like half the head you have to worry That's about true. <laughs> that does kind of balance it out a little bit i travel for a living so i can travel anywhere for free pretty much so <laughs> okay well come on up here and uh i'll do your head cast Excellent. Well, again, Stephen, thank you for being here. Let's uh, get this ball rolling a little bit. Before we get to our episode for the night, I want to do a quick announcement that this week we have a great interview coming out with uh, your good friend Todd Masters, special effects guru. I sat down with him and we talked about his work on the Tales from the Crypt show, the Demon Knight movie, his, uh, the, the work he, start, he did when he first started off with Big Trouble Little China, Nightmare on Elm Street Dream Child. We talked about Look Who's Talking, which I never thought I would do on the podcast. We did talk about Hellraiser Bloodlines. We talked a lot about Star Trek First Contact. And we talked all the different ways you can make fake blood. So look for that interview uh, on your podcast feeds, hopefully on Wednesday. So that brings us to our episode for tonight. Jody, why don't you hit us with a plot synopsis? Oh, this tonight we're doing, uh, I, mean, I did it backwards. Tonight we're covering <laughs> Split Personality, which premiered on August 19th, 1992. 1992. Jody, give us a plot synopsis. <laughs> All right. We open on the Crypt Keeper uh, counting on an eyeball abacus at a card table. So we're, we're getting a little Vegas in here. And he, he had one of his best lines that I, I just really loved. So I had to have to repeat this line here. He starts off with, hello, kitties. Tonight's coffin caper is so crammed with ghastly greed, sickening sex and vomitous violence that parental guidance is advised. So guide your parents out of the room so we can have some fun. Like that's it. exactly what I wanted from Tales from the Crypt. Yeah, that's a classic. A, uh, Dean there. All right, so we open up on a casino, and there's a man named Don playing blackjack, and uh, he screwed up and put too much money down, and uh, he, he's kind of giving the dealer a sob story, talking about a sick kid. And uh, then over at the bar, there's a man named Vic, played by Joe Pesci, who tells him to take a hit on 19. He said, you're going to get blackjack. He's going to deal you two because uh two is his lucky number we find out later so don takes the bet he he takes the hit and uh, he does get blackjack he tries to give vic some money but vic says he can't uh, but he tells him about an investment opportunity and uh, gets a check we find out vic is a con man and he's he, that's his whole thing he cons people for a living and later while vic is laying in bed with a topless sex worker uh complaining about his life he just kind of randomly, you know, in his whole obsession with twos, says he's always wanted to make it with twins. And uh, then later, while driving his car, he swerves to avoid a black cat running in front of him, and he wrecks the car and sees this nice car sitting outside, a pair of them sitting outside. And uh, he enters this house and sees a picture of a man on an architectural award. 
And at that point, a woman comes out and pulls a gun on him for being in her house. Her name is April. Her twin sister's June also comes out holding a cat. And he starts complimenting the house and talking about their father's architectural achievements. He's just bullshitting, but he's good enough at it that he convinces them uh, that he knows their father's work. He understands architecture and uh, they, they like him. Something about him appeals to them. And uh, so he calls for the tow truck, but then he stays and hangs out with them, finds out they're worth $2 billion in early 90s money, which is a whole lot of money. And uh, the tow, tow truck comes, but he, they invite him to come back. And so he takes advantage of that. We get a, a montage of him connecting with the twins and doing stuff with them, helping them come out of their shells. And then he tries to get alone with each of them individually. And uh, they both tell him that their twin sister has a dark side. It's the other twin, though. Not, not me. It's the other one. The other one has a dark side. And he tells each of them that they're the more beautiful one, and he likes that one better, and they both have sex with him. He says he could marry either of them, but if he just marries one of them, he only has access to half of their fortune. He would need to marry both of them. So he comes up with this scheme of pretending to have a twin brother who lives in South Africa. And they trade off every month. One brother will be here in the United States while the other one is gone. And uh, so he tells the twins about this and says, my brother Jack's going to be coming back from South Africa. I'll t I've already told him about you. He's going to come meet you. <laughs> and he's, he's uh, real kind of got a California vibe to him, he says. And so then he shows up in his California costume. He's got an earring. He's got a fake ponytail. And he says words like righteous, but he says them with the Joe Pesci accent, which is just hilarious to hear Joe Pesci try to pretend to do California. He marries both women, once as Vic and once as Jack. And uh, later the girls are watching him uh, while he's down by the pool. So maybe we can finally leave the past behind. Uh, they wish they could have both of the husbands there at the same time, where they make the comment, or we could share which I'm sure he would have been happy to hear. We find out there's a locked drawer in their room, just kind of mentioned in passing. And while he is laying there out by the pool, his, like the, the tie on his robe gets blown up across his back and he gets a little strip on his back where he gets sunburned and that stays pale white. And uh, she mentions that to him. Uh, before he switches out and becomes Jack. Well, then the, the two twins are talking to each other later. And the one who's married to Jack mentions that he has a tan from being in South Africa, except for a little pale strip. And since the other one had seen Vic with that strip, they go to check on things. They go up, he's in the shower, and they find his fake ponytail laying on the ground. They immediately understand what's going on. And while Vic is getting ready, he sees that that locked drawer is open. And inside the drawer is a bunch of newspaper clippings about their father's death. They were suspected of killing their father, but they were acquitted. And while he's looking at the paper, one of the twin clocks him in the head with the butt of a gun. He wakes up tied to a bed with the twins dressed in lingerie standing in front of him. They say they did kill their dad. That part is true because they didn't want to share they don't like sharing some things. Their dad was one thing they didn't like to share and they don't want to share him. And so one twin walks away and comes back with a chainsaw and starting at the crotch, cuts him right down the middle. And we close on both women laying in bed with their half of Vic, uh, gore side towards them as they, they cuddle in their beds. Love it. All right, Stephen, you're our guest tonight, so you're going to start us off to tell us what you think about this episode, but why don't you also tell us your uh, history with Tales from the Crypt? Okay, so I have a traumatic history with Tales from the Crypt. Oh, don't we all? I love it. As a kid, uh, the only episode I really saw as a kid uh, was, I don't know the name of the episode, you guys will have to inform me, it's the one where the guy the criminals like handcuffed to the cop and they're in the desert mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and like a, just a bunch of bad stuff happens like the 
criminal keeps trying to get away and the cop like dies and he tries to cut off the cop's hand i believe he cuts off his own hand by accident and then it ends with him like getting his eyes pecked out by a crow i believe yeah that's a uh, carrion yeah. death yeah yeah so i was uh, at my cousin's house for like thanksgiving or something and my old my cousins who were all older than me were watching tales from the crypt on tv and uh they're like hey steve come in and watch this and so i watched that episode and uh yeah seeing the like the guy's eyes getting pecked out like really messed with me i was not a fan of eye trauma as a kid <laughs> uh, so it really bothered me and like i basically avoided the show through most of my childhood and wasn't able to really pick it up until my teens but uh yeah i still have that memory of like sitting on the couch at my cousin's house seeing that and that feel that kid feeling of like i'm watching something i'm not supposed to be mm -hmm. watching this is bad and then like the, the combination of like guilt and fear was just so like overwhelming that i can like still go back to that moment at any time that'll always be in my brain so that's my weird history with tales from the crypt uh obviously have much more appreciation for it uh no i think that's a, that's a very common story for people of our age that are a little too young to should have been watching it that we kind of saw one almost by mistake and got scared of it and then came back to it a little bit later yeah it's i don't know it's like one of those interesting things where it's like enticing to you as a kid because mm -hmm. it's like adult stuff and like let's be honest the crypt keeper is like he's not particularly scary like he he wasn't the scary part to me as a kid like mm -hmm. i probably could have watched a whole show of just him like doing his shtick so it was like that not it, like I, I felt like as a kid it was hard to reconcile the like fun of the crypt keeper with the like real horror of the actual episodes and so yeah i think that's a shared experience with a lot of people uh from their childhood is this like trying to make sense of this show that's like simultane simultaneously scary and enticing mm -hmm. at the same time. All right, and uh, so let's start us off with what you thought about this episode. I mean, this episode, I had never seen it before until I watched this tape uh, a few months back. I got it uh, on this compilation tape, uh, Tales from the Crypt Vault of Horror, uh, which has three episodes on it. And uh, yeah, you know, I really enjoyed it and it really made me realize that like so much of the show, or at least just maybe this specific season of the show is like so geared more into the thriller vein than into the horror vein uh, in terms of its content. Like this episode, it, like it's like a comedy thriller, like 90s comedy thriller up until the very end and then it just goes real hard. Um, and it's also like, it's like wackier than I was expecting it to be too. Like, I really love Joe Pesci in it. Like his, his shtick fits this character and the vibe of this story so well. Uh, the moment at the, like, it's like the montage of him uh, getting married to the two girls. The moment at the end of that sequence where the camera zooms in on him and he looks at the camera and says bingo and puts a cigar <laughs> in his mouth. He's like, I hope to someday achieve that level of goofy with my <laughs> I laughed so hard when that happened. It is, and, and I, I, that's what I really appreciate about it. It's like, it's not afraid to be silly, which is like a thing that I miss in a lot of like modern tv and movies it's like people don't do that kind of thing anymore uh and that to me is like what's really memorable is that like those kinds of moments that take they like lift you out just for a brief moment to remind you that it's all fake and this is all a performance uh and it just it almost feels like a bit of like audience participation of like <laughs> like he's like looking directly at you and saying bingo did you notice that there's a scene where he's swimming in the pool and I'm pretty sure he's still smoking a cigar as he's swimming. <laughs> oh, I didn't clock that. Is that, is that when he's yelling at the, uh, he's the gardener, like, yeah. arborist or whatever that's out there, like trimming the, trimming the trees. Yeah. I'm pretty sure he's swimming, he's swimming laps while smoking a stogie, which is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> no, that makes sense. I mean, 
there's just like so many weird things in the episode like that house mm-hmm. is super bizarre uh i just feel like like the in i don't know maybe do you guys have any like background on that location like was that a real place um I mean, the interior was a set so they could do that split shot of the two bedrooms or or was it that's like, a great question i'm sure i, I can i mean there are some people that work on it so we'll, we can ask them um but I do think that our whole architecture thing is kind of a nod to Frank Lloyd Wright. Yeah, no, that makes oh. sense. Uh, that's that's why I was thinking with that. If if that's a real house, I want it because <laughs> yeah. like, and I want it to look exactly the way it looks in this episode because I feel like that is my my design aesthetic. Like that's yeah, just, that's what a comfortable space looks like to me. <laughs> um, yeah, there's a lot of weird houses. I, I live in the Los Angeles area, so yeah, you're always driving around, and you're seeing bizarre houses like that. It's no, like not I'll like take, that, but yeah, sometimes just run into something weird. I'll take that house or that weird house from uh, De Palma's body double, that like weird <laughs> soccer house that's on the yeah. still. Like I'll, yeah. I'll live in that house too. Um, <laughs> I found it weird in the episode at the end. I, I understand the uh, like f- filming purpose for it, like the stylistic choice of they're both laying on the bed on their respective beds with two halves of Joe Pesci and having the like clean halves facing camera to yeah. sell the idea yeah. that he's split in half. But it's insane to me <laughs> that they would be on in bed, like cuddling with this thing and they would be on like the gross side. Yeah. The <laughs> talking over it. Yeah. It, I had that exact same thought that they're yeah. just cuddling with like the gore side of things and like yeah, the, like the human looking- side is off on the, for the it, camera. Yeah the nice clean side is away and they're looking directly into like a split brain and like it's like intentionally picking the warm side of the pillow you just, you just don't do that yeah. well, it's from the warmer side the well, side also, of the like, yeah you can see that the blood is like pooled on the bed so they're just laying in sticky blood like that just everything about that seems awful but i guess they're supposed to be nuts so yeah makes sense <laughs> But uh, yeah, what did you guys think of the episode? All right, Mondo, start us off. Oh, God, so I don't know because Jason hasn't called on me yet. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I, uh, like you said, I, I thought this was a lot of just thriller until the very end. But um, that nastiness at the end made me happy because if they didn't go with that, like I was thinking like, oh, God, we have a repeat of one of these episodes where there's just no horror in the whole episode. Um, but I really liked the, the last half of this episode. And I also really like Joe Pesci. I'm a huge Joe Pesci fan, like. Goodfellas, Casino, like Casino is my favorite movies of all time. Like I, I, I just can't, I, I just can't say any bad about Joe Pesci. Um, but what's funny is my wife came in to to look at it while I was watching, and she goes, you know, and she, what's funny is she had a fond memory of this episode, but she always thought it was John Lovitz. Oh, so I couldn't get out of my head that John Lovitz would have also been really great in this too. Well, like yeah. he was in the um, the top billing, so yeah, same same kind right. of deal. Yeah. Uh, but I thought that the acting was was really fun. I love the I did love the breaking the fourth wall. The uh, when he stares at the camera and does that, and then I just absolutely love the ending. Uh, the chainsaw scene, brutal. Yeah. They went brutal with that. I did not expect it to go w- w- when they pulled the chainsaw out. I did not expect they start putting it towards them. I'm like, okay, this is when they cut away, and we see the blood splatter. But no, they went in for it. So I was uh, I was very happy about that. <laughs> that was so, nice. That, that's such a like brutal moment that it does justify the slow buildup. I think yeah. it, it was well executed. For sure. No, uh, also the one thing I really didn't like, but it, it's it's okay because granted this came out thirty years ago. Was I always hate that trope where someone finds the newspaper clippings of all the murders a person. Yeah, done <laughs> because like. <laughs> That's that's what crazy people do, right? Is they keep very detailed files of all the crazy things they've done mm-hmm. and right. put it in a conspicuous drawer that they don't yeah. uh, let anyone in yeah. until they yeah. find. Yeah, it. it's like the it, maybe not the second drawer from the top, but it's like <laughs> it's at a height that you would think like do the bottom drawer maybe. I don't yeah. know. It's, it's at Joe Pesci height. I, 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 I want the conversation. Yeah, I want the conversation of the first twin like putting everything in the top drawer. And the twin be like, you fool. They'll find it there. Put it in the second drawer. Fine. <laughs> right. 
and uh, like like Jason said, one of my favorite parts of the whole episode was the brother from California with the thick East Coast accent. Like I, yeah. I absolutely loved. Uh, I, I love that. So uh, I'm gonna give this episode. I'm gonna say I, I really did enjoy this episode, even though it wasn't heavy on the horror till the very end. And um, it, again, I, I complained about this before. This is again an episode though. Where there's no real true protagonist. Mm -hmm. We're kind of everyone in the episode is, is kind of a dirtbag. And that's one thing I really, it kind of takes me out of the episode a little bit, but I don't really have anybody to root for. Yeah. So, it, it, it does feel like it's doing that like morality tale thing of like, yeah. here's a bad guy and you're going to see him get his comeuppance. And it's yeah. like, and sometimes it's not fully sustainable if they don't, like there was no, uh, like I was expecting there to be a scene where he does something like nice for somebody where we're like, oh, he's a good guy, but that never happened. It was just he was right. a shithead. Well, you know, I was gonna well, I was I was gonna say in a minute, but I was expecting uh the Burt Young character from the very beginning to show up and like that he was somehow related to it, like it was part of his revenge plot for getting screwed over. Yeah, that was a mm. surprising like thing that didn't pay off. It felt like a buried gun that was gonna come back and then mm -hmm. it didn't. Oh, so. yeah, I'll, I'll talk about that one in a minute. But Jody, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, they, they they definitely when they adapt some of these into the episode from the comic, sometimes they fill it in with a lot of stuff that they don't really pay off. And we'll get into the comic in a minute. But a, a lot of the extra stuff like that whole sequence, not in the comic that you've oh. got to fill that running time. Uh, but yeah, I, I thought this was a really fun episode, mainly because of Joe Pesci and uh, the way he did everything in this. He plays comedies really, really well. And this was very much a comedy episode, like his whole character, everything that he did and said had this kind of like wink at the audience in there. Uh, I mean, literally a wink at the audience at one point. But, uh, you know, I, I just I, I liked how he was playing it up. I have a feeling that that California guy having Joe Pesci's voice come out of him was another just joke that he, that he was fully leaning into of, uh, you know, trying to to play the cool brother. I, I was real, when he was describing his brother as being real laid back in California. I'm like, is he going to talk different? No, he's not. He's not. He's going to use the exact oh, same voice. Oh, for, for sure. They knew what they're doing with that. And yeah. absolutely, I absolutely love it. The, the concept of the episode of the idea of, uh, you know, I'm going to pretend to have a twin and I'm going to marry a set of twin. Like, it's just absurd from the beginning, but in a really fun way. Um, and like you said, Mondo, I, I fully expected for them to pull out the chainsaw and come towards him and, and get the blood splatter on the face. That was, I was expecting like yeah. them to get blood splattered, but they went straight for the crotch and uh, started sawing him in half. And yeah, it, it was a pretty great, great ending to this episode. So all in all, really fun. I, I like this one a lot. Yeah, I'll hop in. So just for a little background on this, this was actually directed by Joel Silver, the, um, you know, oh. pro producer, executive producer extraordinaire behind um, uh, Lethal Weapon, Predator, Die Hard, The Matrix. He's got like over, I think like 125 producer credits of like big, big movies. Um, he, and this is like the one of the only things he's ever directed. So I is think like a... On IMDb, it's literally his only directorial yeah. credit. Right. So I, so, I th so I think the producers, and the, we think talked about this in one of our earlier podcasts uh, with Al and um, Gil, where they're like, get, where they're getting so much grief from Joel about, you know, the, how the directors are doing. They're like, why don't you come direct one yourself to see how it goes? <laughs> so it's kind of, and it's actually well directed. I thought they did, he did a really good job with it. Um, it's funny because he does do, do, do a couple little acting bits. So in the episode Split Second, which is about another guy who gets chainsaw in half. There's a bit in the wraparound with the Crypt Keeper where he's, um, but there's a guy tied to a thing and being um, cut oh, up. Yeah, yeah. And that's played by Joel Silver. And Joel Silver also played the director in the very beginning of Who Framed Roger Rabbit, the one that's directing right. the animated sequence, Raul, which uh, I just watched that with my kids and it still holds up really, really well. It's a great, um, great oh, movie. Yeah, there was a thing that went around not too long ago that was like name five perfect movies, and the first one I wrote down was Super Frame Roger Rabbit. Yeah. Like that movie is oh, yeah. flawless to me. Um, since he's here, Joe Pesci's great. Almost, it almost feels like he's doing a um, a like a spoof of Joe Pesci in mm -hmm. a way. Yeah, it's almost like Joe Pesci turned up to like eleven. 
Yeah. Um, which is great. That's exactly what you want to do script. Like if you took out Joe Pesci and put in another actor who just didn't go for it like he does, this would be a really boring episode, I think. Yeah, but he's he, super charming in it, and he sells the comedy better mm-hmm. than I think a lot of people do. Because mm-hmm. there's yeah. other there's other Tales episodes where just the whole episode falls flat, I think, because the lead just isn't, well, isn't right for it. Speaking of Pesci, uh, and over the past year, I watched a film that he did with Danny Glover called Gone Fishing. Mm-hmm. Oh, but I remember that movie. It, it's surprisingly okay still. <laughs> um, just because of, of because of Pesci and, and, and Glover, because they just play it so over the top, they're having a great time. And I'm like, yeah, it's not a good movie, but I think everyone on set is probably having an awesome time. And so I'm having a good time. Yeah, we, we, We've said multiple times that what really makes an episode work is when the actor gets what Tales from the Crypt is. And Pesci gets what Tells from the Crypt is in this episode. He 100% understands what he's doing here. Well, and what's funny is it doesn't like... Yeah, he's like going over the top, but it doesn't feel like it's done in that obnoxious way. Yeah, yeah. he yeah. thinks he's being funny. He's still like, he's still selling it, and he's still like putting the effort in into the mm-hmm. performance. And I think he's just so like effortlessly charming, mm-hmm. and like, his personality like is so fun to watch in these scenarios. That like, yeah, he just like I feel like he elevates it in a way mm-hmm. that like, yeah. Other 100%. Exactly. And, and like, I don't know. Anytime I watch stuff like this, I always think, uh, like, well, like, who are these people now? Like, who are these actors <laughs> now? Because I want to find them. Because you mean the ones that are going to become like this? Well, I just mean like, like the Steve, <laughs> the young Steve Buscemi. Yeah. Like, who do we have now? Like, who's coming up that you guys, like, is there anybody that you guys think of, like, that? you want to see like in a tales from the crypt episode now like like if they were to shoot this episode specifically now who would you put in it well one of my one of my complaints about modern hollywood is kind of the and this is not a knock like on joe pesci i'll use joe pesci's example though is they tend to only want to cast the most beautiful people possible whereas and not saying joe pesci is a bad looking guy or an ugly guy but he was just a great actor with a certain look but he wouldn't like a lot of the roles he got back in the day because how good he was he wouldn't get today and 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 i think that those actors are more um likely to kind of understand the assignment when it comes to this kind of thing uh whereas uh i think sometimes when they hire someone for the purpose of just being because their look that they're less likely to, to get the assignment, so to speak, and, and to go yeah, out of their like way. Like, I feel like it would be like a Zac Efron. Yes. I was right. going to, the first act that came to my head was Donald Glover. Yeah, Donald yeah, Glover, I definitely. I see that, actually. Yeah. yeah. Or, or I could also see, it's the most obvious choice, but like Danny McBride could maybe pull this off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, or, definitely. I, I actually absolutely love Danny McBride. I he's great, him. but I feel like he's one of the only guys who like, gets this kind of shtick and can like sell the comedy and the drama at the same time mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so it's like i feel like we have a serious lack of that kind of actor right now. oh what is that Ke- keegan michael key actually yeah, yeah i was um, thinking yeah, that, yeah, yeah yeah i think he's one of those that can like when he was in hell he's in hell baby he was in hell baby mm-hmm. and played that like over the top but just perfectly over the top where it never it never got into the realm like you knew he was in on the joke so to speak yes yeah um, I also want to hit on the actresses who played the twins, Jacqueline and Kristen Citron. Um, they had a very short career. And I thought they were very good in this episode. They really, yeah. again, they hit that. They're, they're, they're definitely beautiful women, but they're also really kind of awkward. You can tell us something kind of unsettling going on there, yeah. but they're still kind of seductive. Um, so I thought they did a really good job in this role as well. The biggest things that they were in were was an episode of Cheers, an episode of Quantum Leap, but they really didn't do much. And I did like a lot of internet sleuthing to figure out what happened to them. And I really could not find anything. So um, very for curious. Some, for some reason, adult twins wearing the exact same thing is always creepy to me because mm-hmm. you have to plan that shit out. But it's even creepier when they're wearing the same lingerie. Like yes. They both went to Victoria's <laughs> Secret. And uh, like, like Jason, if I go to Los Angeles, we're not, we're not going to go shopping for thongs together. I'm sorry. Like what we'll the oh, man. different color ones. <laughs> um, but uh, <laughs> then why bother? <laughs> <laughs> stay at home mondo I'll, I'll send you the amazon link we'll figure it out but uh, but but this is the 90s where they actually had to go to the store like that the, the the adult twins were in the same thing is always kind of creepy to me whereas as kids i think it's really actually adorable and endearing because usually it's a parents dressing them or whatever but as adults i don't know why that's just it's very unsettling to me but, um yes yeah, so also want to talk about burt young again he does a great job i couldn't tell if he was 
playing stupid or he was just really innocent because Burt Young is usually kind of the heavy in things. You know, he was in Chinatown in the Rocky series. He was in Amityville too. Um, and he's also in Russian Doll recently. You know, he's a great actor. I always love him when he shows up. And I won, I and I was hoping that he would show up again, like again to be behind something or like like aha, my plan worked. Well, talk about the like a, way, a big actor. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, good, good. Sorry. Just just seemed like a waste to have him only in that opening scene and mm-hmm. not pay off in some big way. Yeah, I really like his stuff with uh, with Joe Pesci. Like, I love their conversation together. I thought. Well, I think this is like when you get Joel Silver directing and he can pick like any actor he wants to like, sure. you know, yeah. be any bad, you can choose any actor in Hollywood to be anyone in the background. Well, uh, yeah. They'll on, say uh, yes. Based on Gil now, it sounds like sometimes they just got people because they happen to be in the area and available that day or walked on the set and said, oh, hey. And they said, oh, yeah, come on, come, come be part of this episode. Yeah, it feels like Pesci was like going to have lunch with uh, Bert. It's like, oh, just come on, come come to this role yeah. for for an hour. Get him a payday, yeah. Um, but what I didn't realize till afterwards is that the dealer who's also in on it with Pesci is Joe Pantoliano from yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. the Big Deck Cat episode. I didn't recognize oh. him at first because he had hair. Joey Pants. Joey yeah, Pants. No, I, I definitely recognized him. It took me a minute to figure out why I recognized him, though. I'm like, I know this dude. And by the time that opening sequence had finished, I'm like, oh, wow. Yeah. They just pulled him in just to play this tiny little role in the background. So, real fast, the Burt the, the Bert Young question I had. So the beginning, when he's talking about his child's operation, because uh, I, I come from Las Vegas and I work in a lot of casinos, basically with what I do. And there is zero chance you would not know a $5 chip from a $50 chip. There's zero chance. Yeah, um, yeah, I was wondering that. So there's zero chance. Um, was he on the up and up about the operation he needed for his grandson? <sighs> I still think that that was like a, a, a BS. He was trying to get, he bet too much and then felt bad about us trying to get out of that. And that goes back to my, there being no protagonist in this. Even him, I was kind of yeah. like, eh, he's kind of scummy. I think because it's Burt Young, I want to say he was in on it. But the, right. but the fact that he falls for Joe Pesci's scheme makes him seem yeah. a little more gullible. Yeah, there was no real tell to go along with that being a lie from him either. Like mm-hmm. there, they would have, there would have been like a button on the scene or something that, Gave, sense. gave you some indication of that so the weird cash transaction sense. threw me off yeah and he's like he don't give him a tip and he goes no that's for your son he goes yeah here's more money that's what kind of threw me off yeah um and then and I, I always like to look at the, all the actors that are just kind of doing bit parts and the guy who plays the preacher for both weddings is troy evans oh yeah he's one a- of those that guy actors i um, know him as the cop from uh the frighteners I think he's like the yep. sheriff. Oh, you know, yes. He was, uh, he's, okay, let me, I'm going to do a quick rundown. He was one of the coaches in Teen Wolf. He plays, I think, the principal in the Twin Peaks pilot. He plays a deputy in Halloween 5. Um, he was in the Telescript episode, Dead Right, the one with Demi Moore. I think he was a bartender or something. He was an under siege. He was predactor in Ace Ventura. He was also like the front desk guy in <laughs> e- ER for like 150 episodes. <laughs> he is. Oh, uh, good old again, Roger, Roger Pedactor. <laughs> um, but overall, yeah, this is a great, great episode. I definitely remember the very, very ending shot from when I saw this as a kid. Like, that's just a shot you don't forget. I, don't, I didn't remember anything. I remember that in the bit about the towel. And I, I blanked out everything else. So, like, the whole, like, thing about the, the father. Turns out they murdered the father. I didn't remember that. That didn't uh, come to my memory. But as, as it came up, I'm like, oh, yeah, of course they killed the father. Um, but yeah, I think this is a great episode. This is there's definitely a type of uh, Tales of the Crypt episode where it's like horny guy gets his comeuppance, mm-hmm. and this is definitely a, probably like the pinnacle of those episodes. Uh, I don't know if you have a like a section specifically for trivia or anything, but did you guys read about how that the photo of the dad that's Richard Donner? Mm-hmm. I saw that. That's pretty cool. Oh no, I did. We do trivia. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't see that. That's cool. Yeah, sometimes we have a trivia section. Sometimes if there's something really interesting about the episode, we'll put it there. If it's not, we'll just do something somewhat random. Um, but still, we're late. Yeah, but I, ha- I hadn't caught that, so that wouldn't have been in the trivia. That was <laughs> good. I, 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 I got it now. Yeah, I read that. That was a good poll. All right, let's do our comparison to the original comic. Okay, so this came from Vault of Horror number 30, which was the May 1953 issue. Uh, script and art uh, by Johnny Craig. He did, he did the, the whole thing on this one and like inks and everything. So it, this, this guy did the whole uh, comic. 
And it's it's a really well done comic as far as the art goes. So it's, it's definitely one worth looking up. Um, we find out about a man named Ed who is a charity con man who hears about some wit- rich twins who never leave the house. So he intentionally saves their cat uh, to try to get his foot in the door because they, they never leave. They never go out. They never let anyone else in. But the cat got him in. Uh, they invite him to return back. Both women fall in love with him. He fakes a twin in South Africa. So very much the same story. The whole Vegas thing, that's not part of it. The obsession with twos is not part of it. Uh, one thing I thought was really cool, instead of the tan line thing, this time, okay, so the tan thing happens and the sisters are suspicious, but that's not enough. Like they, but he has that tan, but you know, maybe that's coincidence. And so while he's asleep one night, one of the sisters puts some peroxide on the back of his hair where he can't see it to leave a little bleach spot on there. And then the next day when his twin is there, they see the bleach spot on the back of his head. So I thought that was pretty clever Mm -hmm. uh, because he would never notice that. And so then once they know what's going on, uh, they want to make him pay. And uh, it ends pretty abruptly though with... uh, that they split him in half. There's no buildup to it. They just like, they look all scary and say, we want to make him pay. Then in the next scene, there's the two halves of him laying, you know, nice side out. And they did it with an ax, which I just have to think (laughs) that's gotta be hard, man. (laughs) Like You're gonna, there's a lot of smashing going on. Like they have to be very precise to actually get a half man out of that and still have him, you know, not in pieces. So I mean, if either of you guys ever decide to cut me in half, do you start from the head, though, and not from the dick? Yeah, just, just, out of, just a personal favor, just for me. So, God damn it. not Terrifier style? Yeah, yes, no, not Terrifier. Yeah, the- yeah if, I, if I ever get split in half, I'd rather they start with the head. After that, I don't really care about anything because I'm out. But uh, I definitely don't want it bone tomahawk style. No. Oh, no. No, no, no. Um, but yeah, yeah so just- pretty much the same story. They just filled it out a little bit more. Yeah, they, I was. I read it too, and uh, they don't have the bit with the father. And no uh, father. What, what I thought was kind of funny is that the sisters, when they're talk, when they're talking about, it, they're like, "He's a bigamist." Yeah, they, they were. That's what they were most upset about is that he made them into bigamist. It wasn't so much that he had tricked them. It was like, but this is immoral. We can't be bigamist. Which, uh, for the people who have to Google like I did, is the act of going through a marriage cer- ceremony. While already married to another person, it's having it, multiple spouses. It, it's just funny because my brain kept going through like, how much work would it be to try to pretend to be two different people with two different spouses that live in the oh, same house? It's yeah. just like it's exhausting. It's, like, is it really it's, worth it? Just like, forget yeah. your ponytail one day. You're like, oh, I got a haircut. <laughs> yeah, one little slip up in your tent. <laughs> um, the artwork in this comic was good. Was really good. But what I loved was those. There's like three shot, three panels with the uh, vault keeper. And two of them are like really close up on his eyes. You can see they're all yeah. veiny and like wide. That was really unsettling. I like so, it. Props to that. No, I liked it too a lot. I screenshotted it. We'll do something fun. Um, already. So that takes us to our episode rating. Oh. What, one, one more quick thing. Yes. Did you see who the writer was? Because I said the writer yeah, had to fill in uh, a bunch. Uh, Fred Decker. Fred uh, Decker, the writer. Oh, uh, yeah. The director the of the Top Three. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, they had a good writer to adapt this one. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to do our reading. Uh, we do zero to five. You can do half points, five being the best, zero being the worst. Steven, why don't you start us off? Uh, I you, you, we can come back to you if you want. Yeah, you guys go, and then I my rating will adjust based on what you uh, okay. No, we'll, we'll say it doesn't matter. You go yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah, it's respect it. But, uh, all right, Jody, why don't you go? All right. So I really like this one. Joe Pesci elevates this one uh, beyond what was a pretty, you know, pretty typical script for Tales from the Crypt. Uh, So I'm going to go all the way up to a 4.5 for this one. I just, I really like it. I like watching him in this role. That's enough to push it up there for me. Mondo. All right. I'm going to go just a tiny bit lower. I couldn't quite give it four and a half being that it didn't have as much horror, as many horror elements as I wanted. But uh, if Joe Pesci doesn't just own this, own this episode, and um, I don't think I could ever knock pretty much anything Joe Pesci does unless he starts kicking puppies. 
as long as these are kicking puppies or speaking out against basic human rights. I'm a Joe Pesci fan. So uh, I, I give us episode of four. Mind you write down what I'm going to put? Are you take a guess? Uh, I did not guess your, your rating. Okay, if I guess your rating, it'd be a 3.5. I'm going 4.5. Oh, oh, okay. okay. You're off on that one. Uh, no, I, this is such a fun episode. This is what I want from Tales of the Crypt. I want fun. I will be entertained. I want great actors going big and a good gory ending. I'm just I'm just a happy boy here. Real, real fast. I'm already questioning my rating now. I'm like, damn it. Should I go for it? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's how you felt at the moment. It's yeah, I'm totally still, justifiable. I, I, I'm sticking with four, but it's not like four is a bad score. No, four is not four, bad at all. Four is good. We, four is good. We, we were just talking about this. A lot of horror movie fans, I, I, I take it sort of pro wrestling, I love pro wrestling. Mm -hmm. They think like four out of five or eight out of 10 is a bad score. And no. I'm like, no, eight out of 10 is amazing. Because uh, we're talking about Midsummer, and people were complaining to one of our friends that she didn't think it was a 10 out of 10. It's like, but she thought it was an eight out of 10. That's amazing. <laughs> like, it's yeah. not like that's still a pass. Like, that's, yeah, that's yeah. good. It, in pro wrestling, one of the biggest critics will give matches four, seven, five out of five. And people are like, <laughs> oh, you're an idiot. You don't know wrestling. You're saying that <laughs> he's like, dude, I gave it almost perfect. It's a good score. So, uh, yeah, I think I'm going to stick with four because four is an amazing score. Yeah. Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> I'm not moving. I think uh, I think I'm gonna do the same thing. I think I'm gonna do four because I really enjoyed the episode. It really is the Joe Pesci show. Uh, again, that moment when he says bingo is like <laughs> I'm gonna just give a spot in my brain just to that moment because it makes me laugh so hard, and I want to think back on it every day going forward. Uh, but I did. I do think that if you took him out of it, there wouldn't be like that much going on. Mm -hmm. um and so for that i feel like it doesn't deserve like a perfect score uh and i wish there was just a bit more like horror stuff going on throughout because it is a very slow burn so i feel like it's something i'm like not going to revisit that often yeah. uh, i feel like having watched it twice now i've like gotten most of what i'm going to get out of it but right. still thought it was great and i will give it a four all right, here's here's my here's my rewrite. If we had time in the budget, if they had more time in budget, this is what they could have done. Have the uh, gambler Burt Young character break into the twins' house to try to take revenge on Joe Pesci, but he's not there. He runs to the twins and they murder him in some graphic way just to amp up yes. the horror. Yeah. Well, yeah, and also it then establishes, oh, like these girls are crazy. He could be married to them both at that point, so he's like mm -hmm. locked in and then there's maybe a bit more of a sense of like him walking on eggshells trying to not set them off and then some small thing happens that reveals you know that he's uh been playing them this whole time i think mm -hmm. that would have been like an interesting that. dynamic and it would have given us another like juicy bit of gore part way through yeah you have, to, you have to fit it within like 27 minutes so if they that had another 10 minutes they could have done that but yeah, it's like you got to respect that runtime. So, I mean, it's a great idea in theory, but it would have been a real rushed episode trying to cram all that stuff in. So. If, yeah. if only if only it had been made in the Netflix era where our episodes right. can be whatever length. Yes, I do appreciate that happened. now, is that he can kind of just be whatever the story needs it to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. All right, um, let's turn it over to Al Katz for any great information he has about this episode. And then later. Okay. Mondo, give us your song of the day. Um, uh, Real fast. The, the, the guy who did the soundtrack of this episode, Michael Kamen. Ooh, Do you know what he's okay. famous for, Jason? The Metallica Symphony, The Wall. Right. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. A lot of that. All that stuff. Um, um, yeah, the, was the conductor for um, the first SM record. I don't know if he did the second one or not, but Lethal Weapon movies. No, he passed away like. 10 years ago, I think. Oh, did he? I know. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, X, but uh, the first X Men movie. Yeah. Back when no one cared about comics. And uh, <laughs> hey, I was uh, there. I, I uh, believe we, he did the Highlander as well. Uh, I don't. I, I look it up. I'm, um, I'm on his uh, wiki right now. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Highlander. Um, <laughs> and then one of my favorite underrated horror films, Event Horizon. Oh, right. He did Event Horizon. Oh, nice. Yeah, that and, is great. And another great movie he did, Jason. You like this one? Uh, he also did Nothing But Trouble. Oh, <laughs> uh, I know. If and when we do our Patreon uh, watch alongs, we'll put them on the list. 
I'll, I'll watch that one again. Can I come on that? Yes. If you I join our Patreon, Stephen. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> hey, I'll you, do can, you can be on. Yeah, J- Jason, we're, we're three to one on this one. So. Yeah. <laughs> I'll give another shot. Jason has a website passwords, but I can change it. I'll figure it out. It's fine. <laughs> no, no, definitely, definitely, we do that because Jason always talks about what, what, how it's one of his most hated movies of all time, and we somehow talk about this movie like once a month. Um, yeah, it comes, it comes up. up a lot. That movie comes- has really re-entered the public consciousness for some reason. Mm-hmm. Like, it's amazing to me that something that bad, like we're in an era where stuff that's that awful doesn't get buried and like stay buried it's like now <laughs> like i feel like every few weeks i'm talking about it with somebody like it's just it's Wait. somehow has become current pop culture again are you what? pro or con uh i think i'm solidly on the fence yeah okay. like, it really depends on the mood i'm in because it's such a nuts movie that yeah that, that's when i saw as a teenager and I loved it as a teenager. And so I think I'm carrying some residual teenage love uh, into my adulthood so, with it. I, well, but, so I'm the opposite. I saw it as a kid, as I was younger and hated it. And then maybe like a year or two ago, I was at a hotel for work and it came on like whatever, Paramount Plus or whatever. And I watched it. I'm like, this isn't as bad as I remember. It's so wacky. It's so over the top. And like I said before, they got fucking Tupac and Digital Underground to be <laughs> in this weird Dan Aykroyd yeah. Chevy Chase joint. I mean, the scariest thing about that movie to me is like that is just completely unhinged Dan Aykroyd. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> makes me imagine like what would Ghostbusters be like if he had full control over it? Right. Oh God. <laughs> like, if he didn't have Harold Ramis like reining it in and being like, "Okay, we can't like go to space with your ghost hunting <laughs> idea." <laughs> like, like I think the trouble is like the template for like this is why Dan should always have somebody else like kind of like controlling steering the ship and just i mean i'm pretty go. sure i'm pretty sure dan Aykroyd was the one who put the ghost blowjob into uh, ghostbusters <laughs> before it got cut moment the fact that it's still in the movie and there's like no context for it and it makes no sense right is, like, i mean he must have fought so hard to be like i know this is like this is important this is an important <laughs> part of ray's character <laughs> There, there's a possibility that right now Dan Aykroyd is on the internet researching ghost blowjobs. So just yeah. based on how he is. So <laughs> yeah, He's, he really needs to make that happen. <laughs> um, oh, oh, okay. Go ahead. <laughs> this, this is I Jason. forgot where we I, were. I know the radio guys back in. Um, uh, I don't know if I've talked about the band Mayhem on here before. A band with uh, obviously a very storied history. Uh, the Lords of Chaos movie talks a little bit about their backstory, even though they're their telling of that story was not 100% accurate. Uh, not even close to being accurate, to be honest with you. You just uh, weren't but, there, man. Uh, you're right. I wasn't there, but I listened to, I, I read stuff from the people that were there, which makes more sense than a filmmaker who read a book that was biased. Yeah, uh, shit. Which is really weird, but I'm not going to get into that tonight. Um, but the first song I thought of was the very, very end when the ladies are going to town and this dude with his chainsaw, the, the chainsaw to the dick scene. And uh, it, it, I'm not going to pretend this is a good song and if you guys actually want to listen to what Mayhem's about, the first record, D Mystery, Thom Satanis, uh, classic and black metal. Actually, their newest record, the newest EP, or they did Damon, and they did a recent EP, which I don't remember the name of, but it's fantastic. It's half of its songs that were cut from the last album, and half of it are a bunch of punk covers, which came out fantastic. Um, but uh, I'm going to go with the song they did early on in their careers. One of the first songs they got notorious for, the song is called Chainsaw Guts Fuck. <laughs> Guts Fuck is one word, by the way. If anyone's not out there, <laughs> Thank you for clarifying. Um, it's off their uh, their early early demo called Death Crush, back from the the probably late eighties. I think eighty seven, maybe eighty eight. If you put a gun to my head, I'm not sure what year. Eighty seven or eighty eight. And the interesting part about this is so the, their original vocalist, as shown in the movie Dead, killed himself in a farmhouse. What I hate about the movie. I'm not going to get too deep into it, is they make Euronymous and Dead out to be friends, when in reality, those guys fucking hate, they Dead fucking hated Euronymous, they were not friends. There's a lot of weird shit that went down there. But um, actually, on this album, uh, Maniac, uh, of course, they all have to have these, have these weird names, uh, Maniac did all the vocals for it, and Maniac actually was wouldn't be back in the band until they did, I think it was Wolf Slayer Abyss back in 97. Uh, they actually had uh, uh, Attila Saihar, who's back with the band now, um, did D Mysteries Dom Thanis, who was a vocalist in a band called Tormentor, 
from uh, Hungary, I think, where they're from. Uh, but the only original member of the band still is a Necro Butcher, the bass player. Everybody else has been replaced at some point. Uh, but but Attila was a vocalist on D Mystery, so I guess he could be considered an original member. But anyhow, I digress. If anyone wants to talk about black metal, message me on fucking Twitter. We'll talk about black metal. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, Chainsaw Guts Fuck from the EP Death Crush from the band from Norway that started the genre, Mayhem. Nice. Thank you, Mondo. All right, Jody, hit us up with some trivia. All right, so our trivia tonight is twin trivia. And uh, we can thank Jason for this because I was running late on my trivia getting and he found it for me. Uh, But also Jason has twins, right? So you can verify or uh, uh, debunk any of this, right? Yeah, we... (laughs) When you're waiting for twins to be born, you have a lot of extra time on your hands to just sit and ponder <laughs> the um, mysteries of such. So we watched, I think we watched like all like a National Geography series about twins. The things well, you, you do. Th- there's also a, a great, very accurate movie about twins. It's oh, yeah. Arnold Schwarzenegger and Danny yeah. DeVito. <laughs> yeah, that's, <laughs> that's exactly twins. how that works. A bunch of twins comes from that movie. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> Uh, here, here's some trivia though. Forty percent of twins invent their own languages, which I knew twins invented their kind of twin speak. Sometime I didn't know it was forty percent. That is a lot of twins speaking to each other in their own kind of thing. How about your kids, Jason? Did they talk. I, I wonder what they mean by language. Like, <laughs> well, because I, I have actually seen. Okay, so watching late night TV, some twins like as kids will actually speak to each other in a completely different made-up language that only they know. Hmm. So, you're, so you're saying Cthulhu rises out of the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> right, right, right. Twins. Okay. <laughs> I mean, uh, well, I think my twins are a little unique as in my son has a speech delay, so he it's hard to tell some, a lot of times, especially when he was younger, what he was saying in general, and I think his sister was the best one at understanding him. I don't think that's because of some magic twin speak that they spoke to each other. Okay. She just, the person that spent the most time with him was on this sure. wavelength. All right. Uh, identical twins uh, do have different fingerprints. Some people wonder if identical means everything, but not everything. Uh, twins start interacting with each other in the womb at 14 weeks. And so that's, they, they start this special relationship early on. Twins I- can have different birthdays and the longest gap is 63 days so i don't even know i I guess one was delivered super early or something like i can't figure out how 63 days is a acceptable length of time between babies being born i have a question about the interacting in the womb part like what does (laughs) that mean exactly like are they i don't know man (laughs) probably like you know uh, they probably can't hold hands but like you know put their hands up against each other like having thumb wars and some wars yeah (laughs) yeah keep each other uh, wet willies also, yeah. there's beating the shit out of each other for dominance. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you stay on your side of the womb, I'll stay on mine. Cool. And yeah. uh, the last one, which is good news uh, for Jason's family, is uh, mothers of twins live longer. I don't know why, but they do. Yeah, I, uh, I call BS on that because <laughs> it seems like it would. It seems like it would wear them down to a nub much well, faster. Yeah. Personally, but... Hold on a second, Jason. It's really weird. You're calling BS that your wife your wife might outlive you why is that <laughs> yeah no i'm not, there's no yeah no there's, there's no way she'll outlive me uh, <laughs> <laughs> hold on <laughs> this this may be evidence someday to court <laughs> <laughs> is, there, is there a locked drawer at your house full of newspaper clippings <laughs> no uh, uh maybe i said that the other i think i said that in the reverse way she's gonna live way longer than me but i'm just saying i can't see how twin mothers would live longer than other mothers good. You can backtrack. It's cool. Um, but, uh, do you want do, do you want a fun piece of uh, of gambling trivia? So in, in Las Vegas and most Native American casinos, it's not illegal to count cards, but they can actually kick you out for counting cards. Uh, what they usually do is to say, "Hey, man, you're done playing blackjack for the night," mm-hmm. and they'll make you work some go somewhere else. In Atlantic City, is actually illegal for them to kick someone out who's um, counting cards. Mm-hmm. But what they can do is they can force a dealer to reshuffle the cards after every hand. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Or, they that way take they you and they, or they can take you in the back and put your head in the face. I was about to say, is it legal or illegal to break your kneecaps in the alley behind the place? So there's actually stories about that too. Um, so there's a famous strip club here in Las Vegas called Crazy Horse 2 that was definitely um, run by connected people. And what they would do is they'd wait till business travelers came there out of town and they'd get them drunk and then 
triple charge your card. So if your bill's 50 bucks, they charge you 250 bucks, whatever. It doesn't matter. If you didn't sign the paperwork, they take you out back and beat the shit out of you. So they did that. This actually isn't a funny story. They killed a guy <laughs> and the guy happened to be the son though, of like a high powered attorney or someone high powered. And it got the whole, because it got that whole industry shut down here in Vegas to the point where when they sold the building, they had to do extensive background checks on any bidders because they want to make sure there's no connection to uh, potentially um, uh, connected families or whatnot. <laughs> so I would say like back in the 50s and 60s or even the, you know, like the movie Casino. Yeah. If you got caught, caught counting cards, realistically, those movies are sensationalized. They probably just ask you to leave. If they caught you in a second time, you'd probably have a, not a fun conversation. Could just take a little drive. Yeah. Take a little drive. Well, the term 86, you've heard that term, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. You know what it means. Was it 80 miles out, six feet under? Eight miles out, six feet under. Yeah. 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 Oh. Really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, drive them out eight miles in the desert, bury them six feet under. <laughs> I have a casino question. Uh, we, uh, hold on, should we do some casino dad advice? No, no. No? no? Okay. No. <laughs> is this relating to the episode specifically, and maybe this is a super dumb question, but so you can like cash checks at casinos you used to be able to uh, well, i don't know if you still can so um most most casinos would cash your paycheck or cash personal checks if you cash your paycheck they generally give you a so uh i used to, I used to cash i used to work on um, part-time bars and noble so i get i work four hours a week so i want a discount on books so i get a bunch of paycheck i'd go cash them at the casino at suncoast casino down here every paycheck you cash you give you a token you could put a machine and you, at very minimum, you'd win a free drink. Sometimes you'd win like ten dollars in free slot play. Oh! But you had to put in ten dollars to get the ten dollars of free play. So uh, it, it's it's a really shitty tactic because like I'll use my uh, my old father in law uh, for example because he passed away and my wife wouldn't care because he sucked. Um, but he used to make us go to the casino with him to cast his paycheck because he if we didn't go he'd walk out broke. Uh, so it's a really, really shitty practice of doing that. Yeah, that seems real shady. It's very predatory. And I don't know if casinos still do it, just to be honest with, with you, because I haven't, even though I live in Las Vegas, I haven't been in a casino in, in at least a local casino here in forever. Um, but it used to be a thing where you could just go to the cage, cash your paycheck. But this is also, I'm, I'm talking like, this was over 10 years ago, probably 13 years ago, 14 years ago, before like everyone had direct deposit. Yeah. Um, but the other piece to it too, it's funny, is the beginning of this episode when he hits on 19 that's not a blackjack if you get 21 no. but it's not that the, but the first two cards don't equal 21 you don't get the five times pay or the three times yeah pay. I, I was it's wondering a, about that it's a sta it's a standard win you would double your money that'd be it yeah i was wondering why they, why they called it a blackjack no so that there would be literally no good reason to hit on 19 unless the dealer is showing a 10 also, that was pretty brazen of him afterwards to go up to the dealer and say thank you or whatever. Like, no, yeah. no, you, you, you kind of always sent the dealers uh, for anybody coming to Las Vegas. And granted, I don't want to do dad advice about gambling because I really don't know a whole lot about it. Mm -hmm. But it is commonplace that if you win that much money, you always tip a dealer. No, but I'm saying for him, for the other guy to come in, like the for the Joe Pesci character to come oh, in. Like, yeah, yeah, I can see that. But he was happy because he won his bet or whatever. Yeah, um, it just seemed like bucks. I'd be like, "Come on, no, 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 no!" We yeah, want the pit scene now down this guy. That's when the dealers down here they don't want to win; they want you to win because they want you to tip them. Right? If you take, mm. if, if you come into the casino, I'm a dealer, and I take all your money. You're not gonna fucking tip me. If you win yeah. seven times your money, I'm probably gonna walk away with a nice tip. Makes sense. So, fun bit of gambling advice for the uh, fun bit of gambling trivia. But mm -hmm. if I had any dad advice on gambling, it'd be just don't do don't it. Don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> or my yeah, I would I would say never bet more than you want to lose. The, the idea behind gambling is like if you like to gamble, because I have friends I like to gamble. They take out a hundred bucks or two hundred bucks, mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. They go to the casino, and when that move money's gone, that's it. That's right. Oh, yeah. Go home. If See, they end I, up, I, I didn't do that gambling, but when I was younger, I'd go to like an arcade. And I'd go in with like, yes. okay, I got yeah. 40 bucks in my pocket. I am turning that all into quarters, but my wallet is not coming in with me. Like once I'm out of this money, I'm out of this yeah. money. I'm just picturing yeah, Jody behind like a uh, Mortal Kombat 2 machine with like a soda. It's just like, <laughs> one more quarter, man. Well, <laughs> Another quarter. No, there was definitely a time when uh, we were at like a Boy Scout thing that we were supposed to be at. 
and I didn't want to do it, but it was next door to the mall. And so I went over to the mall where they had an arcade and I played Golden Axe till I beat Golden Axe, nice. but it took every penny that I had. You, you could have bought a Sega Genesis and the game for cheaper. Yeah, this, yeah. this was me yeah. just avoiding Boy Scout stuff. <laughs> I just want to picture Jody right now playing Mortal Kombat and just smashing like nine-year-olds at his local like mini golf course or whatever. I know now what you do. I've taken my kid to an arcade like this. They have one where you pay like to enter mm -hmm. and then all the games are set on free play. That's cool. Yeah. And so you can, That's... you know, you pay like 15 bucks and you can play there all day long, any game you want. It's hey, awesome. Okay, I'll, I'll shout out the neon retro arcade here in Pasadena. The, yeah. It's like, I think it's $10 an hour. They have like three different Mortal Kombat machines, a couple street fighters. And... Yeah. Centipede, Joust, everything. They they sometimes have the four player um, turtles. Sometimes have the four player Simpsons. They have a great pinball selection. They had the yeah. Joust Secret Pinball for a little while too. So if you're in the LA area, uh, check out Neon Retro Arcade in Pasadena. That four player Simpsons is one of the best arcade games. Uh, oh uh, yeah, I wholeheartedly the agree. Movie theaters in the '90s for me. Yes. There or that X Men game. Was the X-Men yes. game. Yes. But um, have you have you guys played the new one, the new turtle game? Yes. It's uh, awesome. I, I hear it's amazing. It's, it's so fantastic. Good. Yeah, I, 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 play, I play with all my kids. <laughs> like we all pile in the room mm -hmm. to play. It's awesome. The only downside yeah. is it's short, but that's yeah. fine. Do you guys have it for Xbox? No, yeah. Switch. All right, so, so, uh, Jody, why are we not playing together? It's online. Yeah, we need to. It's have, they have online co-op on it. So yeah, yeah absolutely. Get on this. I love that game. Wait, I gotta get it. It looks amazing. It's, I love that we're in this renaissance of like new retro games. It's, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I, I, that and the uh, want to be <laughs> the Streets of Rage one was really good. Yeah. They also have a collection of the original uh, the Turtle games coming out sometime in the next couple months from like the I SNES. Can angry, I can get angry about that underwater level. Exactly. <laughs> so I. Think, I Go ahead. So I, picked, I picked up the Mega Man Legacy games on Xbox, mm -hmm. and god damn it, those games piss me off so much. Like, yes. I thought, like, I can beat this, I'm an adult. No, I don't, I haven't beat a, si a single level. I've got through my <laughs> controller through the fucking window. I was like, this is so yeah. hard. So I, I hard. can't do platformers as much as I'd like to think I can. Like, that's just a whole era of game I am not skilled at. I, Same I, here. Was, like, I was a PC gamer kid, so. Mm -hmm. I my vice has been buying every version of Doom that's ever come out. Yes, uh, and so yeah, I'm playing original Doom from what like 25 years ago on my PS4 and my big screen TV is like <laughs> pretty absurd. But oh, it's uh, great. Yeah, I wouldn't have it any other way. One of my favorite things about Doom was when they released it for Super Nintendo, or maybe it was N64, and it was the red cartridge. Mm -hmm. I just thought it was the coolest thing back then. Oh, yeah, that was the game. Super Nintendo one. Super which Nintendo, I'm yes. baffled that they could fit that game on a 16 bit cartridge. It it kind of looked like dog shit, yeah. but they did it somehow. Uh, and the cartridge was cool. Shout out to modern video games. I just started playing um, Wolfenstein New Colossus. Oh, it's good. I, it's good. So much fun. So I beat the one before and I forgot what it's called, but uh, I was like, God, like the fact they brought those games back and they're just they're not a whole lot of bells and whistles to them it's just a solid fps yeah and that's all i want <laughs> have you found the arcade machine in that game not yet i just started playing. oh can i give you a mild spoiler nope absolutely not okay <laughs> i i love that all the games i'm playing are just like the same games from like the early to mid 90s like and like they're all just like updated versions of the same thing like i feel like my whole life is just going to be me playing doom Mortal Kombat, Wolfenstein, and just like some variation of those three franchises is <laughs> coming up. Like every year, there's going to be a new version of one of those. Mortal Kombat, though, putting all the horror icons in there mm -hmm. and putting like Robocop and Rambo, like they're, they're definitely targeting us. Like that's what they're doing. It's so <laughs> crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Just the fact you can have Rambo versus Robocop is <laughs> like Terminator and have an alien fight a predator is, yeah. It's they're really catering to our nostalgia. Oh, uh, definitely, hundred percent. And we're buying. <laughs> yeah. Um. All right. Do is do, do we just do retro gaming dad advice? I, I think. Well, I think. Yeah. I think our dad advice is going to be just video gaming because why play not? Video games. Yeah. Just um, play old video game properties. 
Yeah, actually, so here's something. If you are in a major area, look to see if they have any retro gaming stores or conventions. Mm -hmm. They have one, and again, in Southern California, the uh, Southern California Gaming uh, Retro Gaming Expo. Uh, at least they have in Pasadena, but due to COVID this year, they moved it out to a less populated area. And again, just walking through, I took my whole family, and just seeing the art just brings back so much nostalgia and yeah. just brings up the imagination of my kids. Because they're just looking at all the pictures on the, the covers and the games and everything, and they were just so like into it. It was amazing. Do I've, any of you guys have those arcade one up cabinets? No, I wish. but that I've Terminator the Terminator Two one was on sale for like three hundred bucks on uh, for Amazon Prime Day, and I seriously thought about thought about buying that. Well, that I'm looking at it. It's oh, <laughs> oh it you son one. of a! Awesome. I I had to get it. It's my favorite arcade game. I like grew up on it. Same like, here. It was at like the airport. It was at the movie theater. Like I couldn't escape it as a kid. So when I saw that they were releasing that, I just I did the pre order. I was just like, take all my money. I don't care. I have to have it, and uh, uh, it's awesome. I love it. I have yeah, the most, that looks so cool. I have the most middle-aged ma- dad thing when I see those now. I'm like, oh, I just know if I can stand like a hunch over to that height for, <laughs> for as long as I'm going to play. With, it comes with a riser, though, so it's at uh, a height. Yeah. Which what, what, is, what, that, that was the issue early on, was they expected you to like sit at the consoles, and yeah. that's dumb. But no, yeah. now they give you risers, so it's okay. at an actual like, eye level. But what Jason's not telling you, though, is he's like 6'4". Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. So you'll need <laughs> two risers, probably. Yeah. I mean, the most annoying thing about it is that now I just have this big cabinet in my basement, mm-hmm. but, uh, <laughs> and it's like half the size of what the cabinet, like in real life, actually is, like the original cabinet. But it still is like a big thing, so it's a commitment for sure. So but, here, here's my question: So it's the one with the the uh, gun attacher, right? Yeah. There's two guns mm-hmm. attached. Uh, they're they're on uh they're wired though as opposed to like attached to the actual yeah. like cabinet. so you could could you swap in the joystick if you wanted to and like mod it probably Maybe. i was watching some mod videos online and like there's people who put like just every light yeah. game on it which i would like to do because i would love to play like house of the dead or something oh yeah, yeah. Mm. But uh, as far as swapping to a joystick, I haven't seen that. That would be super frustrating, though, to play. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but no, well, other like home games would be smart. So, well, real fast on the Sega Genesis when that game came out in the Sega Genesis, oh, yeah. they had that weird like light gun that was called like, the, the the Phenom or something weird, the, like the bazooka. Um, yeah, but you could play it with the controller actually. Yeah, as a and you yeah. just move a cursor. Kind of like kind of like uh, I'll go really old school. Kind of like in the NES, you guys ever played Operation Wolf? Mm-hmm. Um, oh, uh, yeah. very similar to that. And, but it wasn't as fun as using the, using the actual light gun, obviously. No, yeah, yeah it was really slow. It, yeah, with the controller, and it's annoying as hell. Yeah. That would be a uh, good Switch game. Man, the, the, the level I remember on that game, these are frustrating me, is you're in the back of the, uh, the armored truck, mm-hmm. and you're trying to oh. shoot down the helicopter. What I've learned from now, like, playing through the whole game start to finish, is that there are... The, those truck levels, like, there's the one where John Connor's on the back of the truck, you gotta protect the truck. Yeah, and then the one where it's the van and the helicopters ramming the van. Those two levels are basically designed to eat quarters, and <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> because, like, the only way I could beat both of them was operating both guns simultaneously <laughs> and setting it on like the lowest difficulty possible. That's they, badass. Like, th- those levels are so frustrating. It's insane. How have you not posted on Instagram? All right, so you're, so I so yeah, I filmed myself doing that. I'll ask you guys one question for dad advice then. It is, uh, it, the, it, you are in your childhood. Your parents dropped you off at the casino. You have a roll of quarters. You can play one game. What game, what game are you playing? Casino or arcade? Well, sorry. Down here is the <laughs> casino. We had, oh, so back, back in the old days in Vegas, every casino had a badass arcade in it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that, because it was totally cool to drop like your eight-year-old kid off there and then go gamble and you'll pick him up later. <laughs> so it's totally fine. Um, so you're in the arcade. Uh, you pick your age range. I don't care. Let's say back in the '90s, you have a roll of quarters. What game are you wasting your roll of quarters on? Oh, well, it's, it's funny you mentioned that because the first time I went to Vegas, we went to Circus Circus, where they did have like a really cool arcade. My yeah, parents yeah. Jumped us off there. Um, I'll definitely face the X Men game. That was just so much fun. I was a huge mm-hmm. X Men nerd um, back in the day. That was my game. Yeah, that's a great game. I'm going to have to go with Golden Axe because that was my game that I actually did that with. Uh, it, was, it was a lot of fun. All right, Steven. 
I'll go last. Uh, I mean, I just went on my long rant about how the team yes, is that, could, that could be your answer. Yeah. Well, I would have to pick that, but I there is a runner up that would ha- I have to mention, and that's the Alien versus Predator arcade. Mm, oh yes, yes. Which I have so many fond memories of. I remember playing it in an arcade uh, at the mall with my dad, and we mm-hmm. just like were at that thing for a solid two hours, and it was just like one of those fun memories that I you know i, I want to hold on to because it was such a good time that game awesome. kicks so much ass and is like the best version of alien versus predator in any medium yeah. in- mm-hmm. agreed uh, they, um, they redid that for the atari jaguar yeah, yeah. i had i had a jaguar i was one of the like 50 <laughs> people on earth who had one uh and i just well, recently I- found it again but yeah it had the awesome alien versus predator because the controller on the Jaguar was like this big and had about 50 buttons on it. It had all this huge row of buttons <laughs> and you put a card on there that like had all the different uh, buttons described. And so like when you're playing as the alien, you put down that little card that would show like, okay, tail swipe, uh, spit acid, all this stuff. Or as the predator, you would have all those different things. And that was the one game I remember playing on the Jaguar. It was that exact same thing sweet I, I have a very obvious one for me when i was a kid it was wwf wrestle fest <laughs> yeah. game is wrestle fest and then the runner up when it came out in the arcades was killer instinct Ooh, i felt that was a good love game with killer instinct um i love that game just so much so that's my runner up um yeah i'm gonna piggyback on steven though uh one my birthday is must have been 10 11 12 right around there I remember my birthday was on a Sunday. My dad woke me up pretty early in the morning. He said, go on your clothes. Let's go. I'm like, okay. He took me to a nickel arcade and just, you know, give me as many nickels as I wanted. And we played uh, the Aliens arcade game. Oh, that's uh, cool. And uh, we played that from start to finish. And that's like one of, yeah. my, one of my favorite birthdays of all time. Yeah, and that this- one has, it's like side scrolling, but mm-hmm. then it also has like shooting sections. Yeah. And you get like, to go on the power loader. It's yeah. badass. Oh, great game. I, I, I have great memories of playing games with my dad. We didn't go to mm-hmm. arcades as much, but uh, we had uh, an NES, you know, back the original NES, and he got really into Zelda. Well, oh, the cool. original Zelda gave you nothing. Like, there was no maps. There's no indicators where you're supposed to go. It just dropped you off, and you got a sword, and then you figured out the rest. He had notebooks that he <laughs> drew, like, you know, the gridded, like, notebooks where it's yeah. got he would draw out the dungeons and like map them himself on paper so that he could figure out where all the stuff was and mark where like here's where the boomerang is and all this stuff and uh that's so cool wow. then i'd sit and watch him play <laughs> well, that's my, commitment. yeah back it, when games were hard as hell yes yeah. it, like, my, my my dad was too busy doing cocaine and, and meth to play video games with me but um uh, anyhow uh no my, that's a funny story though i came from work one day and i bought that little snes mini and uh, mm-hmm. my daughter and her boyfriend are playing Mario Kart. And like, Dad, you don't play Mario Kart? I'm like, no, but I can try out. I'm like, I'm about to <laughs> fucking ram so many red triple shells up your guys' asses. It's not even funny. <laughs> <laughs> I just smashed the fuck out of that Mario Kart. And oh, it, warmed nice. my, it warmed my dad heart. <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right. Well, that wraps up another episode. Steven, thank you so much for joining us. Thank Where you. can people yeah. uh, follow you? I. Uh, if you want to see what I'm up to, I uh, have an Instagram, uh, Steve at Kill Kostansky, uh, or no, it's just at Kill Kostansky is my Instagram account. Um, and yeah, that's kind of where I post my movie stuff, what I'm working on sometimes, uh, fan art and stuff for PG. That's, yeah, mainly my uh, social media presence right now. Uh, do you have any projects coming up you want to plug? Uh, I mean, this PG comic's going to be coming out soon, finally. Uh, I'm super jazzed about it. It's like kind of turned into our own version of like a heavy metal magazine. Oh, that's it's cool. Like an anthology comic uh, about the alien council from PG. It's like it technically takes place during the movie. It's like the council waiting for Pandora to get to Earth to fight PG. So they're just swapping stories about like their encounters with PG uh in their lives and so you kind of get a little bit of backstory on each alien and what they're up to and uh how they narrowly avoided pg murdering them so wow different artists and writers for every segment uh so it's just like wildly different tones and styles it's uh 
really really cool i can't wait to like hold that thing in my hands because it's that's uh, awesome yeah i haven't heard about that when does that come out uh well we did a kickstarter for it last fall and it should be coming out i think it might be going to the printers like in the next few weeks awesome so nice. very good so i'll i'll post about that on my uh, yeah i'll look for that something concrete uh for it but yeah <laughs> who's the publisher uh, it's lethal comics okay cool uh, yeah. and and you can still pick up the vinyl soundtrack too from uh waxworks still has yes that. i believe that is still at waxworks uh i'm not sure cavity colors has any shirts left but they did do a run of shirts yeah. plastic meatball has toys uh either rlj or raven banner are the source for the blu-ray if you want to get that there's yeah all kinds of pg crap floating around <laughs> love it <laughs> so all right well good luck on all of that Definitely. All right. Next week, we will be reviewing Strung Along. We appreciate everyone for listening. We really appreciate it if you give us a rating review on iTunes and a rating on Spotify. And with that, we thank you for listening to Dads from the Crypt. Adios. <laughs> Follow Dads from the Crypt on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Or I will follow you to the grave. <laughs> no, seriously, you really should watch. But be careful what you ask for. You may get it. <laughs>